Hey, welcome back everybody. It's me, Steve from the Pinball Room. Today, we're gonna go through, while we're waiting for the weather to get better, because it's still so cold outside. Um, <laughs> yeah, we had a couple days of like 70 degree weather and now we're back down to the, to the low to mid 40s. So, too cold for me to um, do any clear coat. Uh, with that paint booth I built up. So it's just kind of sitting in the garage, taking up space, waiting. Today we're going to go through a couple of different tools. We're going to start talking more about the lighting for our inserts. And a few different steps we're going to run through here. We're going to talk about the monitor, Emission Pinball Framework, the MPF monitor. That cool little tool, if you remember, we did a short video earlier. Kind of talked about how you can upload a picture of your play field and add switches and things to it. You can also add your lights into that spatially, like visually, so you can play with them. So we're going to mess with that. We're also going to try um, Mark and CD. Um, he's the creator of the Nightmare Before Christmas homebrew pinball machine. It's been around for a while. Amazing machine. Um, one of these days, I'm hoping to be at a show where he's at so I can maybe have a chance to play it. Um, I think we're kind of in opposite um, locations geographically, but awesome machine. Um, it was a huge source of inspiration for me when I very first was starting out in my homebrew. I was following along, reading so much of his threads and seeing how he went about things. And between that and John Marsh's space balls, his build and then the, um, the the crazy pinball amigos, all of their builds. Those have been like my primary sources of inspiration to get me going and convince me that I can do this too. Anyway, so he, Mark, has gone through and built a light show creator tool um, a while back. And it's only for Windows. There's not a back emulation for it yet. So I'm going to get my really crappy Windows PC um, laptop and see if we can get it running there. But I was watching a video. Um, about how it works and it looks like it's gonna be pretty slick. So I'm hoping to be able to use that to make some really cool light shows. So we're gonna talk about all that today. Let's see how much we cover. Very first thing I don't think I've showed you yet is going through and I'm gonna switch over here and show you on my screen. Just gotta get it loaded up. So I'm going up inside my editor here and we've got uh, another YAML file called lights. So we go to our main config file Inside that config, we identify kind of our subconfigs, and I've got several here already um, outlined that I'm most likely going to need to do. And this is based off of all the amazing help I'm getting from everybody else who's gone before me and already figured out how to do the coding. We've talked a little bit about this in the past, right? Is going through and making all your files, um, instead of having like one or two massive files with all these lines of code you're trying to dig through, have everything much more compartmentalized. Um, what's the term for it? I don't know, modular almost, right? But broken out. So we're gonna have a specific file for our keyboard controls that we define, a specific YAML file or config file for our display information, one for our light shows, one for our track mode, um, one for our images for each mode, right? Anyway, so in here I've got keyboard, displays, slides, switches, coils, lights, devices like ball devices, images, video, sounds, multi-balls, ball saves, combos, those are the ones I'm seeing that most everybody else are doing at least that level. Some are doing even way more, some are doing a little bit less. So I'm kind of showing this is kind of like, probably like the base of where I'm gonna start at least those. And I'll probably even end up having more. And if you see here, I've gone through, I just commented out the ones I'm not working with right now. I stubbed them out so I don't forget them, but I've got them commented out. So I've got the keyboard, but for today, last time we talked about images and things like that for the fonts. Today, we're gonna talk about the lights file that I created. Let me go in here into my lights file. Like every simple MPF file, you're basically gonna go through and start with this commented outline of config version equals number five. Then the next thing is you need to go through and just define, here's your lights. And this is just a tedious thing. I don't know any faster way to go through and do it. There's a few different ways you can define them and label them. I'm just calling mine LED zero for the very first one, down to LED whatever. Um, and actually I've got, let me show you something else I've got going on here. So I went through Within um, Fusion 360, I've got my CAD file of my whole playfield, right? It has all my insert holes, plus all my post holes, plus it has holes for my, uh, for my GI lighting, my general um, uh, illumination bulbs. And so I've got that in there and I went through Fusion 360 and I exported it, I believe as a DXF, um, I think was the file um, export. I'll put it there on the video because I forget exactly. Uh, but you could export it as a, as a vector image file. And I exported that, I brought that into the um, image um, application that I've been using, Figma, which is really not made for this, but oh well, that's what I've been doing. All right, so in here, I've got this image, and so it's just black and white, and it shows all the lines of all the cuts and everything, right? And what I've gone through and done is I've labeled each of the places where I'm going to have a light and given it a number, so I recognize where these are going to be on my play field. I've got two primary strands, um, red and blue here, so I can kind of tell them apart. And anyway, so I start at zero right up here. This GI bulb is zero. I'm gonna start from the back of the cabinet because that's where the wiring is gonna come in and then it'll kind of propagate out from there. So we've got zero, then over here we've got a one, 
and then for these pills, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way around. I tried to go through and do it in a way that's gonna hopefully naturally flow with the wiring that I'm gonna need to put in to support this because each one of these lights are then gonna be connected in this order. Because again, remember the LEDs, they automatically get their assignment based on where they are in the chain. Well, I should correct, that's one way to do it. The way that I'm doing it in my code, let's go back to the code for a minute. I've got my lights, I've got LED zero, I've got a start channel for the very first one, meaning it's gonna be um, zero, zero. So it's gonna be that first like header on the nano for me where my LEDs are gonna be coming out. So it's the first one, which is zero, and the very first position, which will be zero. And each one of those can handle up to 64 um, channels um, or, or LEDs, right? And not channels, I should say, but LEDs. I have to go through, you have to define your subtype as an LED, the type, it can be RGB, it could be GRB, it could be GRBW, RGBW, like there's, that's gonna match the specific LEDs you use and what type they are, right? So there's, there's great documentation on MPF about how to go through and kind of um, uh, define exactly which one matches your type of LED. For me, they're just simple RGB. You can also add in tags. I've got some basic tags in here. Um, I'll probably add more to this later on as I actually start doing the actual light show creation, right? And trying to manage all this for right now. I'm adding a label of GI to the bulbs that I know are just going to be my GI versus my actual insert ones. And then I'm also adding to everyone just what, which chain they're on. Chain, chain one or versus chain two. Anyway, we'll see how that works. And then the, for the ones that are actual inserts, I've added playfield underscore inserts. That was one that was recommended in um, MPF, and I think that's just because that's like an easy common tag if you just want to just hurry and turn, do a light show that like flashes all your different playfield inserts like at a rate. You can, anyway, different ways you can tag them to basically kind of group the inserts and then easily remember, oh, this group, my uh, all my multiball inserts or my hurry up inserts or things like that. So I'm probably gonna be going back through here and adding more tags to these. But anyway, tags, we can do whatever we want with it, right? Okay, so then it's just LED zero. And then once we get to LED one, look, instead of saying the start, the start channel, I just say previous and I define the previous LED in the chain, LED zero. And so it's gonna follow that same sort of channel and just like increment, right? And then LED two, previous LED was LED one. So I'm defining kind of the order that which LED, you know, is, is next in line. And this is gonna be the way it's used because then I'll go through and define it this way to where when I run my light shows, it'll know which one's which in the chain. At least that's my understanding. I'm a little foggy there. I'm still kind of figuring this out, but I. I feel pretty confident from everything I read through that this is this is one simple way to do it, just to find the previous LED and you can move through your chain and you're and you're great. Okay. So this goes all the way through down here. I've got uh, until LED 59. Okay. And then you'll see I've, I'm doing a little bit of a bit of a break. And now I'm doing LED 60. And now I'm going through, because that basically takes me down. If we look over here, if I can go from zero, one, two, three, four, five all the way down, these ones here in front of my drop targets, around the pop bumpers, they go down and around, and we just kind of meander our way through these stars, even up to the other side of the inlanes over here on the right-hand side, the, um, the ball guides, the ball save, back over here. So all of that is 59 LEDs, and that kind of gets me down one side of the play field a little bit more. So I could fit in five more, but like, I don't have anything right here right next to them, so I'm just gonna stop it right there. So in my code, I stop there. LED number 60 now is gonna be starting a new channel, channel one, position zero, okay? And this all says chain one, it should say chain two, okay? And then LED 61, again, we'll go back to previous, previous LED, 60, boom, boom, boom. All the way down through, I've got a total of 99 LEDs is all I've got on mine, okay? And that, you see here on the image, we go back. I'm gonna start at 60 again at, the, at this side at the back of my play field go around everything for that upper play field. I'm kind of guessing here, because I don't know exactly how many LEDs I'm gonna put in the upper play field. I haven't gone that far yet. I haven't really figured it all out. Stage lighting and things to backlight, the, the acrylic. We'll figure that out. Right now I'm guessing that I'm gonna want four LEDs to backlight that acrylic really well. And then another six to do things for like light shows and update whatever's going on with the upper play field. You know what, we might need more, but that's what I've got right now. So 10 up there. Then we come down and we start going through the play field, 70, 71, 72. Um, these little circles with X's are where I've got posts, so I know I don't need a light in there. Those are for my upper flipper post. Um, anyway, 70, 71, 72, 73, all the way down here, 74, 75. You can just kind of move and drag these around on the, on the picture. 78, wrapping down around, 
81, 82, 83, 45, boom. Anyway, wrapping down the other side of the play field down to 99, okay? So that's how I went about it, just kind of visually map out, okay, where are these, which one's numbered which? That way if I go through and I get an error on something like, oh, this LED isn't working, I can look at my picture and say, oh, that's LED number 24, I can go in my code, update, double check things, anyway. I feel like that's a good way to go about it. So your mileage may vary. I'm sure there's lots of different ways to map this out and, and account for it and plan for it. I just did mine visually on this sheet. Um, yeah, okay. So that's that's my lights file. I believe that is all we really need just to define the lights. Okay, I'm just saying these are the lights, what type they are, um, what, uh, what subtype and what type, et cetera, what chain they're on to define them um, through fast, and that's it. And then having that, we can go inside the MPF monitor. So let's jump back over into that now. So we're gonna to go to our terminal and we will go up to open up MPF monitor. We've got two different windows. So I've got two terminal windows open here. One that's gonna launch the monitor and then I've got another one that's gonna go through and launch MPF in the virtual mode. That'll go in the background because MPF monitor, it's looking for an active game in order to bring up information, right? And so once we start up MPF monitor, in fact, let's go through and do this. We'll start up the monitor. Bam, here we go. So it remembers my image of my play field. So here's my play field image, right? Got Had the set with like a little bit of opacity so I can kind of see like the holes behind my ramps and behind my upper play field. So that's in there. <laughs> I do have my coordinates on there. I probably should have got that out of the screen. But I've come over here to devices. Remember, this is where I was putting in the switches. There's, there's nothing here right now. That's because there's no active machine instance running through Mission Pinball Framework. So it's just like, all right, here's a play field. We're waiting for it. So if I go over here to my other terminal, MPF both dash X, and I start it. And then it's going to start up. Okay, there we go. So now i got my track sequence, all that kind of stuff. Now if I switch back down here to that other Python window, put this back on top, now automatically I'm seeing, oh, switches, lights, auto fire, all the things to find inside my config files, right? I've got drop target banks, flippers, diverters, some switches, a stepper motor, anyway. And I can go inside my switches, and then this is where we then clicked and dragged and dropped them onto the image, if you remember. So we've already got a bunch of switches here. Okay, so that's for all my switches, but you also see I've got, I started to go through and drag some of the lights over here. Um, and then I stopped because I want to you know, record and show you some of what I've been doing. So if we collapse switches and we go to lights, see there's three channels in the data here. There's three for each light for the R, G, and B, red, green, and blue. Um, and you can expand the LED and it shows the current color that it's set to. So if you're going through and playing the game, you can it will kind of show you that information in there as well. What we need to do is drag each of these onto the, onto the play field move them to the right place, the right shape, et cetera, orient them until you get all of them um, in. Now I've done a bunch and I forget exactly where we where I left off. It should have been, okay, I've done those switches. I've got five over here in these, um, of these drop targets, kind of these diamonds. So if I go back to my picture of my play field, that means I've done 24, 25, I'm up 28. So I should be on 29, should be my next one here that I need to, I need to do. So, We'll hide this and go back and let me get down here to 29. And I just click and drag it onto the play field. And then here it is, okay? I move it into position. I come down here. I toggle device inspector, right? And then I click it. There we go. And now my device default, I can go to a square and then I can rotate it. Boop. There we go, size 0.4, I think all of these, if I switch to a different one now, right? Yeah, our 0.4. Okay, so this is kind of boring, but I, you gotta take the time just to go through and get them in place, set them to whatever shape you want. I'm trying to kind of max match the shape of the actual insert that these lights go to. Up to 31, set the shape. Rotate it, kind of match, just so I get it visually, generally, the way it's going to be, right? Um, and we've got to go through and do that now for everything, for all these LEDs. So I'm on 32, and i got to go all the way through now 39, I mean 99. All right, so I'm not going to bore you with all this. We'll kind of jump ahead, but you got to go through and add them all inside MPF monitor. And once you get them inside MPF monitor, then... We're gonna go through into Mark's light show creator. It's gonna use the monitor.yaml file that's created by the MPF monitor. It'll load that in 
And then based on that, we should be able to go through and start playing around with light shows. All right, so here we are over on my PC laptop with Mark's show creator downloaded. I unzipped it. We're gonna open it up by double clicking on led.exe. The first thing it's gonna ask for is for that monitor.yaml file that we just finished creating inside MPF monitor, right? So we're gonna to navigate towards my project folder. We're gonna open up that file and voila, here is Mark's show creator app, okay? So let's walk you through the interface really fast, kind of tell you about each little thing. I, I spent about an hour and a half yesterday, I tried just to do like a, a quick recording and say, hey, we're gonna learn this together, right? But my screen recording broke on me, so I didn't save it out. And I ended up floundering around quite a bit during that hour and a half, trying to kind of figure out some of the nuances and tweak some of the things to make sure things really work the way I wanted them to. It's a little bit, a little bit particular. There's a couple of things that are not super intuitive. I spent another hour this morning playing around with it, creating some actual animations I'm going to show you that I think turned out pretty cool. And now I, now I really like this app. I, I mean, I love it. It's, is it perfect? No, it's a, it's a quick app that Mark put together and, and you know, Thank you so much, Mark, for taking the time to put this thing together. It's going to be a huge time saver. The more I'm using it, the more I see the value of it. So much better than trying to very tediously hand code the animations. I couldn't even imagine doing that LED by LED, step by step. That would be crazy. Okay, so what do we have here? We have a simple app that's going to allow us to go through and create basic animations. Each discrete animation is going to be called a segment. You can create and then save out segments. The segments do not have code. A segment file inside Mark's app is just a way to save a certain um, portion of an animation. You can save lots of segments. You can load them back in later and use them as like building blocks to create more complex animations. Once you have a, a collection of segments put together, that's called a set, a set of segments. And then you can play an entire set. You can either have them playing like linearly one after the other with like, you know, a delay in between them or not. You can also like have like, um, have them playing on top of each other concurrently. So they're playing at the same time, multiple animations going on at the same time. So there's options to kind of mix and match, take your building blocks and make more complex animations, which is really cool. Now, that being said, the word of thumb, the word of advice, I guess, rule of thumb, the word of advice is best practices is stick with simpler animations because you can always stack them and combine them inside MPF. If you try to go through and create really, really complex animations here with hundreds of hundreds of segments, I mean, more power to you, I'm sure you can. But I, I think it gets really, it can get very unwieldy and very difficult to make sure you're managing the timing and the transitions and everything exactly the way you want. Again, this is not like a professional Adobe After Effects animation studio with all the tools for everything you're used to if you're an animator. This is pretty basic. It's very powerful still in what it can do, but it's meant just for light shows. They're kind of simple and what we can do is all two dimensional, right? Okay, so segments, sets. Once you have a full set, you playing it back, you like it, you're gonna hit Shift P, that's gonna, export out a script which will have the actual code that you can then load up inside MPF, call it as a, as a show and play that through your light show player, okay? All right, so segment sets and exporting. What else do we have here? How do we actually create an animation, Steve? Well, if you notice this fuzzy circle here in the middle, this is the basis of how things are gonna work. Behind it, all around that, we see all my inserts like they were brought in from MPF Monitor. Now, when I first brought in mine, things did not line up and render exactly the way they did in MPF Monitor. Some of my squares were still kind of big and overlapping, especially like the ones I rotated as diamonds. A few things were like a little off in their X, Y coordinates. So I actually went inside my uh, my notepad and text editor here, and I went in, I found the specific inserts, and I edited the file to make them a little bit smaller so they didn't overlap as much. The 0 .04 was fine in MPF Monitor. Here they were still kind of chunky and overlapping, so I changed them down to 0 .03. I made a few tweaks like that to kind of line things up and make them visually represent more accurately how I view my play field in real life, right? Okay, once I do that, I never had to do it again. It was great, never have to touch it. It remembers it, it's all good. Okay, so you've got this view of all your inserts and then overlaid on top of it, it's important to think about it that way, you're gonna have this shape that you can move around. See how I can click and drag this around like a spotlight? Think of it this way, wherever this spotlight goes on top of an insert, it means that insert's going to be turned on and it's going to match the color of this shape that I'm dragging around on top of it. Okay, so right now, these center three are gonna be white. Right now, nothing's lit up. Now my pop bumper insert, that's why the shape I have for my pop bumper is lit up, right? Okay, now I'm not gonna be dragging the shape around in real time and recording it. It's simpler than that. Let's go through and actually change the shape because there's lots of different shapes you can use and based on the shape, you're gonna get different effects, right? Different patterns in your lights. There's actually a lot of shapes you can go through and use. Letter T, there's a list of shortcuts here in the middle bottom of the, of the app that tell you what these shortcuts are for the common actions. The first one is T to change the shape. So I can have a circle with a gradient or a line with a gradient. Here's like a square with a gradient applied. Here's a half circle or a quarter circle like an arc, right? 
Here's a color wheel with a whole bunch of different colors. This one's fun because any insert this overlaps within that circle will be turned on, but it's also going to match and inherit the color of this, of this picture. So they don't have to be black and white. Okay. Here's a spiral, different spiral, a colored spiral, an arrow, bunch, bunch of kind of like Chevron triangle things. That one threw me for a loop at first. Like, what is this really going to do for me for animations? I found a cool option. I'll show you. Okay. Now let's just do something like a basic circle. Okay. Wherever this circle is, it's got a solid edge. Things will either be on or off. Now let's say we start in the top left. Okay. Again, every segment is discrete. It has a starting position and a stopping position or a finishing position. This is the starting position. You can toggle between your starting and finishing position by the space bar. Also clicking up here where it says finish position. This kind of labels and also lets you toggle which one you're in. When I hit space bar, now I'm in my finishing position. Let's say I wanted to go from top left to bottom right. Well, I can just click down here. It'll move it or I can drag the circle down to the bottom right. Now my starting position is top left. Ending position is bottom right. So what do we think is going to happen? Well, well, let's preview it with the U key for underline. It, anyway, it, anyway, that's the key. Hit U. Oh, I see it moving from top left to bottom right. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. Another cool key, the letter L, lets you toggle between seeing the actual shape that kind of masks uh, out your inserts, turns them on and off, to only viewing the inserts themselves. So now let's hit U. And now I just see the inserts as they are overlapped by that circle getting turned on and off. That's what my light show is actually going to look like. Okay. So there's value in being able to see it both ways. What's the general path I'm taking with my shape? And is my shape getting bigger or smaller as it goes? Ah, oh, that's another thing. So the letter um, C will let you increase the size of it. Hold down shift. It'll do the reverse of your action. So this is going to shrink it. Okay. So now we can start big and go small. That might be important for you. Maybe you'll start small and go big either way, right? There's lots of options here for your, uh, for your shapes. <laughs> that was funny. All right. What else do we got? Well, we can change lots of shapes. Like I said, right? The letter T, let me show you all the shapes that it comes with real fast. We'll go back over here. We've got folders for the segments you'll save out for the sets you'll save save out. And then also for the shapes, it comes with all these shapes. You can create your own, create your own patterns and shapes and throw them in here. Okay. You need to do it in a, um, a PNG file or what all of his are that allows for an alpha channel An alpha channel. If you're not familiar is what allows you to have like a transparency layer inside your image. So looking at these, most of them are black and white. There's two that are colored, right? I said, you can use color and the inserts will inherit that color if you want, but black and white, you'll be able to set the color inside his app. You can transition between colors more easily. Whatever is black in your image is just going to be ignored. It's going to be like transparent. And the white part is what will actually be, you know, going on top of your inserts and turning them on and, on and off based on being overlapped. I think that made sense. Okay. So we got lots of shapes in here. Again, you can create your own, add them, throw them back in. Okay. Let's go back and let's talk a little bit more about some of the controls and some of the interface up here in the top middle it says current. This is expressing the current values of your shape where it's at. And it's going to be either your start position or your finish position. As you hit U in preview, you're going to see those things change. That's what is creating the change between them, right? So my starting position up here, I've got underneath current, I have CUR abbreviated for current, current X position, X coordinate position. And then below that, my Y position. If I click and drag this around, you'll you see, see those two numbers moving, right? Okay. The next one is current R or current red for RGB. If that's my red value, then below is my green value. Below that is my blue value, RGB. If you're not familiar with RGB, RGB goes from zero to 255 are the values that are, um, that are accepted. And the higher the value, the more strong that channel is, right? So if I want a pure red, I would turn up my red all the way to 255. Now you can't click on any of these and like type in a manual value. I wish you could. That's my one, one pet peeve with it, right? My one wish but you can come down here to these color sliders, right? You've got one for your starting value, one for your finishing value. If you go to starting value, if I click on the red and I drag all the way down, there's little bars, little tiny handles. They're kind of hard to see. That kind of shows the current value. You can just click. It'll jump to you where your cursor position was. Or let's say I want to turn my green off. I can just click and drag it all the way up. Same with my blue. I can drag it all the way up. And now I know my green and my blue are both turned off. My red's turned all the way on. And guess what? My circle is now red. If I hit the space bar, that'll jump to my finishing position, right? And let's move it down here to the bottom right. It is purple. Let's say I want it to end at being blue. So I will click and drag up here to turn off my red and my green. And I'll turn my blue all the way up. And now I've got a blue circle. And now if I hit U, I will transition not just between the size of the, of the shape, but also the color of the shape. 
Now you cannot transition from one shape to the next. So if I change this shape to you know a plus, if I go back to my starting one, it's now a plus also. The size and color and position, all that will stay, but you can only have one shape per segment. Okay, now you can have multiple segments. Again, you can kind of change through segments, but for within a segment, you can only have one shape. Okay, and let's go back to a more fun shape. I don't know. Again, I like the circle. It's just simple to work with a circle. Okay, those are those values. Now, those values are mirrored down below. Oh, okay, the last three, I forgot, sorry. Then we also have below RGB, we have CUR space RTS for current rotation. Okay, so actually, let's do something other than a circle so you can really see the rotation happening. If we hit A, that rotates. That's your shortcut for rotate. And we'll see that value changing. It goes up in values of two degrees at a time. So I'm up to 22. If I go all the way up to 90, and yes, I can't type in a value. You can't hold it down, so I just have to tap, 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 tap away. I went past it. Oh, if you want to go back, hold down Shift and the key, you'll go the reverse direction. So now I'm back to 90 degrees. Again, if I want to increase that size, I think I already said that. C helps you increase. Shift C helps you decrease that size of that shape. Okay. And then you can also scale it in X and Y. And if I hit the S button, that's gonna scale it in X. I've rotated it, so now my X value is actually up and down. If I hit X, I can scale it in Y. So you can distort shapes. Because let's say we have this. I can start to distort this in different ways to make it skinnier or fatter or all those things, all right? So you can adjust the shape on the fly also. Now we reset it. It resets your scale and your Y, your rotation, everything's reset. We can go back through and change to a different shape. Let's just do a, a simple circle again for right now. We're gonna shrink it down. And one of the best practices I've been told, and I agree with, is to think of your um, animations in kind of one of two ways. Either you're gonna be doing like global animations that are gonna affect like your entire play field, with like these big sweeping animations of colors floating back and forth and cycling through colors and swirling around. Or think of your animations as very discrete like clusters of inserts, okay? Maybe you want to have like a, a chase pattern up and down between some inserts that are next to each other. Well, you don't want a giant one that impacts everything. You don't want to necessarily mix with all these other segments that have to do with other ones. Let's make it discrete, let's keep it by itself, and then you can mix it with other ones inside MPF. So in mine, for example, Let's say I wanted to go through and create like a chase pattern for these three LEDs right here. I would start here and then I would end. Oh, look at that, it's big already, right? I could drag it and try to resize it down and take the time to do all that. Or I can do it once, put it where I want it to start. Then I can come over here to the right hand side and over here it has information about this segment is on. I can turn the segment off if I want that segment off so I don't see it, I have it on. I can change the length of time here that this animation takes by moving up or down on the, on the time. The more time it takes, the slower it's going to move, right? I can jump up and down between segments. This isn't really add a segment. All the segments are there. You just have to turn them on and off. This is really like navigating up and down between segments. If I navigate up a segment and it's off, it's still there, but I'll need to turn it on before I can see it. Okay, I'm gonna keep that off. The next one down here, hidden and finish, hidden, start hidden. Honestly, I still don't know what those means. I've asked Mark, I'm waiting to hear back. I, I haven't really noticed a change in that, in the code, what it does. So I'll post it up here if it, if it does do anything. I'm not sure what it does. Um, concurrent is once you have more than one segment. Actually, we're gonna come back to that one. Let's go to any, what I really wanna show you is copy current. Copying current is gonna, whatever the current position, color, rotation, parameters for your shape, all these values up here, we're gonna copy that. And then if I want to have my end, um, have my any position be the same, I'm then gonna hit paste finish. Okay, and you think, well that's boring Steve, why, do, why would I wanna copy and paste? Well, because I don't wanna have to worry about rotating and shrinking and changing colors all over again. So I'm just gonna copy it and now I'll just drag it down here. Okay, now my starting position's up there. My ending position's down here. When I preview it, okay, actually I had it backward. This is my starting and that's my finishing, <laughs> but it's gonna move up. Now that's probably going a little slower than what I want. So I'm going to take, it's taking one full second. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, almost two thousand. I think that's off a little bit. One, one thousand. I'm going to speed this up by making my time go way down to like half a, half a second. Now let's do it. Bingo. Okay. Shrink it down to be pretty fast. And now let's say, okay, I wanted to go up, but then I wanted to come back down the other direction. Okay. So then we're going to add a segment. I'm going to turn it on. Oh, we got this fuzzy thing. Well, I could go back, I could copy current, but you can also copy your entire segment. So I'll come down here, I'll hit copy segment. Now I'll go back up to my segment. 
segment number two, it's actually number one, but it's my second segment. And now I will hit paste segment. Look at that, now I've got it. Now, sometimes when you copy and paste, it will only paste the one, I'm not sure why. So let me go back. I've got this whole segment in here. Look, go back down a segment, come on, Steve. I've got this whole segment, I'm gonna copy segment. I will go back up to segment, I will hit paste segment. And now I've got them both. So sometimes you have to, you have to paste twice. I'm not sure exactly why, but keep that in mind. Okay, now this segment is doing exactly the same as the other segment. Well, what if I hit reverse segment, bingo, and now it's gonna go the other direction. And so now, since they're both on, I can hit P, and they're both gonna play. Ah, now they're playing at the same time. Why? Because I have this set to concurrent up here. That could be a cool effect that you want, they're kind of going in and out through each other, right? Totally acceptable. I want mine to be more of a chase thing, so I'm gonna change that to follows, and now I'll hit P to play all my segments. It goes up, it goes down. It goes up, it goes down. Now I got my chase, right? And again, I can adjust the speed in each segment in case I think it's still maybe taking a little bit too long between each one. Then hit P to play them both, boom, goes back and forth. Now I can switch to L. Remember, hit L to switch, and now I'm just seeing the actual LEDs as they turn on and off. And now I see those flashing on and off, on and off. And again, maybe I want those to go a little bit faster. I can keep cranking down, that's fine. I got no problem with that. Crank that down a little bit more. All right, now let's play it. Now it's going really fast. Ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. Okay, so that would be one animation I would create. I'd now go through and I'd save out that segment. And uh, you could even go through and save out the, that, that script as a script of, of code. I'd say that's my right stand-up chase animation. And then whenever I wanna play that, I can, whether it's for a specific mode, if I wanna mix it in an attract sequence with a bunch of other ones, I can load those all inside MPF and play them all at the same time. It gives me these building blocks, lots of options, all right? Um, let's see, that's, that's really kind of the gist of it, right? So you're gonna have a starting position, you're going to have an ending position, you can have multiple segments, that allow you to kind of go between, you know, and combine them. You can change shapes, you can change size, you can rotate it. Let me give you some examples of some of the fun things I've created, okay? So I'm gonna go over here, I'm gonna load a set. So here's one. This is just, this is just taking the that rainbow shape, enlarging it over the whole entire play field, and then I'm just rotating around 360 degrees. So now if I turn off the shape and just do my LEDs and I play it, bingo. You see that whole thing just going, right? Isn't that beautiful? I think it's beautiful. So that's a whole play field one you can do, right? And again, maybe that's going a little bit slow. I'm gonna speed that up a little bit maybe, okay? Whatever speed you want, bingo. Okay, so that's one option. Now let's do some more specific ones. Let's see, I did the right stand-up chase. I can also do the same thing over here for the animations over here on the left, going up and down. Again, might need, might need to speed those up some. Do a little chase pattern back and forth. Ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. Okay. I could have that one going plus the other one going. I can stack them on top of each other. Here's one that I thought was kind of fun. So for me, all of my major shots are these ones here that have like the circle to an arrow. Those are kind of these major shots. Now I can go through and I can play that, having created lots of those, and I get this like cool, like kind of pulsing pattern, right? Again, this is going a little slower than what I probably want, but you see it, okay? And now here's the LEDs getting turned on. But I can kind of simulate this, like whew, the lights are flashing out to certain thing, right? So I can com I could combine that with some other ones. So this was a whole bunch of different segments and put together into um, a single segment. So I've got all these different sets or um, segments, I should say, I have all these different segments that when combined, they went through and they created that final set, right? Okay, um, what's another one here? Um, we can do another full play field one. Let's have this big like wedge, right? And what's it do? It just spans around. So what do the LEDs do? They just sweep back and forth, this big sweep that goes one direction around to the other. Again, this is probably a little bit slow. All these are playing a little bit slower. I'm not sure why. Need to speed it up a little bit. Shroom, up and back, back and forth, okay? And let's see, one last one for you. This is one of my favorite ones I've done so far. This is just a bunch of rings, four segments of them, that animates through 
like this. Might seem kind of boring, right? Well, what if we have four of them going in a pattern? And we get this ripple effect going on with the inserts. And that I think is pretty slick. Especially when you take that combined with how the inserts are actually laid out on my play field, it kind of gives you a different effect. Um, another fun one here. Oops, not a segment. Where's the other set we had? Here's one. What if we just have this? This is our start and that's our end. As this animates through, what do you think that's gonna look like? Actually, I wanna make this a little bit bigger. Hmm, let's see. It does this cool kind of like flicker effect that slowly makes its way up the play field. I think that's probably, I, I think that's pretty slick. I think it looks pretty cool. And again, it's because every time a line goes across an insert, it turns it on and off, on and off. So we're kind of getting this, this flickering effect of them going on and off and kind of slowly growing out. All right, guys, that's pretty much it. That's just kind of scratching the surface, but hopefully it gives you a general idea of what type of things you can do. Um, Last one, maybe. What else did I have here? I had a cross that rotates four times, right? Boom, it's going to rotate through. So as we do this, you'll see them spinning around. The light's kind of spinning in a pattern. Again, I could combine one that's blue, another one that's red, kind of offset the rotation, and we could do almost kind of like the color wheel thing again. There's lots of options here with all of this, all right? Okay, all right. A huge shout out to Mark and City for making this app. Thank you so much, Mark. The more I get into it, the more I see the potential here, and it's going to save me so much time, and I think it's awesome. So thank you for providing this for free to the community, just out of the kindness of your heart. Like, thank you so much. Thank all of you. I thank you all. Thank yourselves. Thank you, everybody. Thank yourselves for coming along on this journey. I know this was a long video, kind of long-winded. I'm sorry. There's lots of steps to it. I recorded this so many times. I kept having so many crashes on my screen recording software. So I'm a little worn out here by the end, not quite as interjected. Maybe I normally am. I apologize for that. But thank you to all my Patreon supporters sticking around. I know I haven't been super active in that community and provided you a lot of like extra perks. You get your stickers, you get your t-shirts, but and all of you will get your name inside the my pinball machine and the credits when I'm all done. But thank you. It really means a lot to me, guys. Um, it's helping pay for my clear code and other things. So I really appreciate the support. And yeah, man, just... This is fun. You can download this tool and play with it even without having a um, pinball machine. Um, Mark has left all of his monitor files in here and his own animations. You can go through and open up and see his play field. Let's do that really fast. Bonus material, if you want to stick around. Let's go through and load up his, where it says load lights. We're going to go through and load up his. Um, there we go. This is his, um, his play field with his lights. Let me reset the segment as a circle. So these are the way his um, inserts are laid out in his play field. We even have some of his animations in here we can go through. Like he's got one called, I like this one, Ball Locked. Remember, animations can do more than just look pretty. They can also be communicating things. Think about the audio and the visual together and how they not only will entertain but also inform someone on your pinball machine. Right? We've all played pinball, right? Shoot the flashing lights. Well, sometimes you have to know when the light's flashing. Sometimes it's more than just a single light flashing. Maybe it's... You just locked a ball and you see this animation. It's shoom, all going up to a point. Everything's kind of slowly going to this point. Again, all the animations are running kind of slow right now. I'm not quite sure why, but you'll see how this works and all the lights kind of zoom and zoom into a certain location. Let's imagine you're going through and maybe in your game, there's a mode where someone has to go through and hit a shot a number of times. Maybe they, they keep pounding on a captive ball until they finally blow up something, right? Well, every time you hit that captive ball, you're probably going to have like a light flash, right? And, and a sound that goes with it. Well, that last one, when it blows up, is it just the same sound and that same light again? Okay, maybe you have a little, you know, a little explosion sound and your lights maybe flicker. Or what if, you know, when it hit the, that 10th time, it hits that target. As soon as it hits that captive ball, then you have this ripple effect of lights that come out and there's like this shockwave sound and the whole thing, boom. I mean, think about how much more immersive and captivating and exciting that can be for the player, right? They hit a jackpot, flash the jackpot light. Why do you do something with your whole play field, right? Like we've seen these on pinball machines. There's tons of examples out there. I guess my recommendation is, or my suggestion is just my admonition. Just, just don't forget that. For me, that's so much the heart and soul of a pinball machine, right? Are the sounds and the light, the more immersive and captivating that they are, the more they really celebrate moments. When you finish a mode, 
Don't just light the insert that says mode completed. Add something to it, right? Have a light show go off, a simple little sound. Doesn't have to be crazy, right? You can still be subtle. A little bit will go a long way, but not too subtle. Let's make sure people see it. Change the color, do a little animation, do a little something, right? Again, it doesn't, doesn't have to be the whole entire play field, but those little things will be like, oh, that's cool. Boy, you've really put the polish on this, right? The people will be so much more impressed with your machine if you take the time to do those little things. All right, I'm done preaching, get off my soapbox, but I'm so excited. I can't wait for it to get warm out here finally in Utah. It's been cold for so many weeks now. Again, I've made my paint booth, I haven't been able to use it yet. So hopefully it'll be warm in another week or two. I'll be able to spray my, my, my white wood and get my LEDs in there and we'll actually be able to import this code and figure out how to get it set up inside MPF and actually play. I still gotta figure that out. But man, we're getting there. It's a lot of fun. Thanks for coming along for the ride. I'm sorry, this one kind of dragged on. I'm gonna to try to edit down as much as I can to be more concise, but thanks for coming along for, for the ride. Thank you all my supporters. Really appreciate it, guys. And yeah, just have fun chipping away at your own pinball machine. I'd love to see if you guys come up with any other fun shapes and animations, post them, let me know about them. Either if you see me on Facebook or through YouTube, through my email, send me a link and just share it with me. I'd love to, to share them. There's some really cool ones. I'll share them in a future video when I'm working with my LEDs again and share them with everybody else, okay? All right, enough of you guys. Take care. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.